I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Explosion 4. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Please, I was never given the payday. Has you been accounted for? Okay. 610B, now is the main date, 610B. I'm out uh, here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. See up there, the top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. Got people on the front fire escape here with windows fences below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary searches are underway. Hey, welcome to Old School, where fire service tradition lives. I'm Rick Lassie, along with my buddy John Salka. John, uh, we, God, we always get going on these topics uh, we're around the phone or we're teaching together and 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 uh again the whole premise for our listeners for this this show the whole the whole you know idea behind it came with with john and i just either sitting around while we're teaching at the end of the day or in our hotel rooms kind of talking or in the lobby or on the phone or we're just visiting and we get going on stuff and they were like oh god we should be recording this you know we should be just you know just and just just for the just for the the fun of it of just being able to share some thoughts and and you know neither one of us are the end all cure all know it alls by no means we're the least perfect people I know, but you know, being able to share some information, but um, you know, John, one of, one of the ones we talked about uh, wanting to visit with folks on was something that we, we, we've often referred to. I know I have as the three dimensional fire. Um, you kind of mentioned uh, uh, describing as parallel operations, but like the three dimensional fire, meaning, you know, the first arriving, the first new company, you know, and or companies, if they're, you know, engine and truck at the same time. And then the second part of that is all your second assignments, the second new companies and people getting in there and so third and fourth do. And then you got command, you know, you've got all three, right? The first, the first two arriving sets that we've talked about the first, the first five, five minutes that takes the next five hours, if you will, or so and so forth, you know, the, the you know, the, where the first line goes, so goes the fire and all those things. And then behind that, we get, we get our vent and our search and second lines and all this stuff. And then you have your IC, you have your, your, your battalion chief, your shift commander, your deputy or whatever that pulls up and kind of pulls everything together. Um, well, we, actually, before we get into the first to a second, do talk, talk your thought behind the, the parallel operations idea or concept. You know, I was, I was with a, a buddy of mine and we've mentioned it many times here. Uh, my buddy, Jay Jonas, he's a, a deputy chief, uh, acting division commander right now up in the seventh division. Great guy. We were in the same probing class together. And uh, we, uh, we were risk it three together. We were young firefighters and risk it three together. He's a godfather. One of my kids, he's a, he's a great guy. Just celebrated. We both just celebrated 40 years, but he still made it. He, he's still on a job. He just did. We just did 40 years last year. And where, again, uh, where, remind me where he, where's he at again? Say again. What, what's his assignment again right now? He's a, he's a deputy chief in the seventh division. Yeah, seventh division. But was he an acting? Or was he a acting division commander, which is the senior, you know, the senior of the four chiefs there? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay. And, cool. uh, so he and I talk often about this and about that, and and he, he's a regular writer. He writes a, a monthly column for uh, WMYF on on major well known fires. And how about his newsletter? That's what I'm talking about. It's unbelievable. Hello. I just read the Macy's one. It was unbelievable. The Macy's fire was right before I got on the job. Walter it was Smith. In the summer of seventy nine, and I got on in the fall. Walter Smith, dramatic. right? Yeah. Walter dramatic. Smith was a probie with our friends Sal Marchese and Donnie Hay. They carpooled together. And real quick before we move on, isn't that the fire that had this again, sadly, but had a, a tremendous or significant impact on how you guys go about you know, systems that are out of service, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I actually learned a lot reading that article yesterday. It was very interesting. And, and also was l- the lieutenant, the uh, firefighter Walter Smith was killed in that fire. And, the, and his lieutenant was, uh, was Pete uh, Hayden, who became chief of the department. Oh. And the battalion chief that operated there was John O'Rourke, who became chief of the department. Holy Two of them cow. spoke with each other at that fire. Yeah, pretty interesting. So, uh, so talking, to my, talking to my buddy Jay recently, and he, and he started talking about uh, that had a job somewhere and um, something was going on. They were, you know, they were making progress. It was, uh, you know, still doubtful, but uh, but they were moving forward. 
Now he's a deputy, so he's got he's got a couple of battalion chiefs there working already. They're already implementing their strategy. They already got lines stretched and searches underway and ventilation going. But Jay is still thinking, gee, if this doesn't go well, I'm gonna have to stretch lines over here, maybe a master stream over here, maybe get a tower ladder set up over here. And you know what he did? He started doing it. He told them, listen guys, just keep doing what you're doing. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start something else going here. And and he got some lines stretched to the side of the building and he he pulled a towel ladder in. He had some some rigs move out of the way so a towel ladder could be put in place. And and the battalion chiefs were almost like concerned, like we're going to the towel ladder. He said, No. But if we do, I want to have it ready. I want to have it supplied. I want to have it in position. I don't want to decide three minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes from now. Oh man, we're gonna have to go to outside operation, back him out, and then start saying 31 truck, see if you can get your rig over here. He said, I already have them in place. If we don't need it, if you if you guys get it done, which I think you're gonna, then they just unhook the hose from 31 truck and they put the boom back down and 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 go home. So I thought that was a pretty cool idea. So cool. Then I wrote an article called Parallel Operations. He actually started the next level of operations. He actually started before the level that was that was in operation, that was underway, before it failed, before it came up short. He started deploying rigs and having hose lines laid in the anticipation that if he needed them, it would save him time and he could immediately put them into operation. And I thought that was a fantastic strategic thought operation for a chief to start actually not thinking about it, but actually doing it, putting the pieces in place. And whether you need them or not, who cares? If you don't need them, you, you roll the hose back up. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so that's kind of where I'm going with this is, you know, you, you brought that up about, you know, kind of, I, I took a picture years ago when I was uh, the training chief in Darien Woodridge on the Southwest side of Chicago, John, I actually have it in a class in the back of the buggy, in the back of the Suburban, Wayne Messenger, uh, he ended up being chief of the department. What a great guy. I loved work. Wayne and I did a lot of fires together. Um, I actually had, I, I put a crystal ball back, you know, the little command unit in the back of the Suburban. You open the doors of the wood cabin, the radios, and I put a crystal ball back there. And I talked about, you know, I use it in, in not only in, in the safety or survival class, you know, managing the mayday or managing an incident, being able to see what's coming. But just like you said, that's, that's, that's like crystal ball in it, right? That's like, all right. I, I, I've said this before on this show, my good buddy and mentor, Chief Tom Freeman from Elmhurst, Illinois, longtime chief in Lyle Woodridge, another South Sider originally, Evergreen Park. Tom's the one that taught me, John, a good officer is the one that can predict his or her next alarm. He used to say, any mope in a white helmet could stand in the front lawn and burn to the ground what you got in front of you. If you turn around, don't have enough help there, enough apparatus, whatever, shame on you. Because your job as the incident commander is to look into the future, is to predict where the fire is going to go or potentially could go and make arrangements to change that and support the BCs and the crews and everything else. And that's just kind of what you said, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why, and although what I'm going to say right now is, is sort of a different topic altogether that we'll cover some other time, <clears throat> that's why sometimes I'm bothered when I read an article or hear a story about a, a chief that 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 gets involved in pulling holes or helping them set up something because gee i just gotta help i like being with my men i love getting this work done and i'm saying to myself you know what i like doing it too but i chose to study and i chose to stand in front of the building with a white helmet on and my mind should be three miles ahead of them pulling that hose i should be thinking what if what they do works and what if what they do doesn't work and if i get involved in in, in pulling holes and, and make making enough couplings i don't know how my mind could be three steps ahead of them or three miles ahead of them well, exactly. You and I have seen the videos. I, I've looked at you and went, he's out of his mind. You know, you, you see, you see this, you, you, the person that should be the, right, the person that should be the calmest, we've talked about this, good incident commanders, you know, they give clear and concise orders, like we say, clear and concise radio communications, what we're talking on the radio, give it to whoever it is. But at the same time, you know, they should be the ones losing their minds, running around, screaming, hollering, grabbing, grabbing hose, grabbing tools, breaking windows, doing stuff like that. Someone needs to be in control. So we've said it before. We, I think we just talked about one of our shows. They dialed 911 for us. We can't dial 912. 912, we're at the end of the phone line here. And, and if, we, if we can't handle the emotional side of it, the, the anxiety, whatever, oh my, what's going to happen if something bad happens or a mayday? So you're exactly right. We're the ones that should be standing there and, and, and making decisions. And kind of, we're the one. And, and part of that comes back with having, right, having confidence in, in the people that are running things below you, right? If you're, if you're the battalion chief, 
having confidence in your captains and lieutenants and acting officers. And you don't get that way without sitting down and mentoring and training and talking tactics. Right, John? Yes. And, and you know, what, you know, what's important about this particular topic that we're talking about this parallel operations, this idea of somebody, somebody thinking ahead of what's actually going on and maybe starting to actually set stuff up for the next level of operations, whether or not it actually is going to happen or not. What's important about this concept is, is it's generally not your first level incident commanders. And I don't mean your company officers. I mean, your first level incident commanders, your battalion or your district chief, your first arriving chief officer, the first guy or gal that arrives on something other than a fire engine with a white helmet and they're standing out front running the show. Those people are generally going to run that first level, that first alarm, the first do, even the second do people are going to come in. They're all still going to be reporting to that first chief. They're all still probably going to be going down the same path. They're probably all still working on that same strategy. We're going to get a line in the front door. We're going to go up the interior stairs to the second floor. We're going to, we're going to try and uh, commit a, uh, you know, a hose line to an interior, aggressive interior operation there. We're going to get some ventilation underway, maybe get somebody up to the roof to do some uh, vertical vent for, uh, for the floors above. So that, that's the strategy and the tactics that are underway. Now the next level chief arrives, whatever that is, the, the, the district chief, the, the deputy chief, the command chief, the citywide tour commander, whatever it is, it's the next level above your first level battalion, right? They pull up and, and that's, that's the Jay Jonas that I'm talking about. That's the deputy chief that I'm talking about in the FDNY. But every, every department has it. Maybe the guy's coming in from home. Maybe he's a headquarters chief that goes after work and fires are transmitted, but it's that second level. It's that next level chief officer that arrives that should be able to, if he trusts his people that are running that first level, running that first alarm, he should be able to turn his attention to setting up what he thinks might be needed next if what they're doing doesn't go well. And that's what Jay was talking about. He was talking about not just thinking about it, but actually doing it. You know, the division one to ladder one. Yeah, bring your, bring your rig around the other side of the building and set up on the number four side. 10-4, chief, you know, engine seven two. I need, I need a five and a half inch hose or I need a three and a half inch or whatever you're looking for, right? To some, uh, I, need it, I need it laid over to the number four side where I just sent ladder one. So he actually starts setting stuff up that's not going to be used at the, at the strategic level that they're at, but he's actually going through the motions and getting the stuff in position, charged, staffed, and ready to go. And then when they decide this ain't happening, chief, we're going to have to back out. Okay, back out. The minute they come across the front door, the threshold out the street, boop, he, that towel ladder's on and not going to fire down rather than at that point calling everybody to start moving stuff around. I thought it was a, a great concept. And I never had really heard it before. Now, I'm not saying it's never been done before because they probably did it in a lot of fires that I was running thinking it wasn't going to go well and they had other stuff set up somewhere else. But I think it's a great idea if you have the resources and, and the, the depth of vision to do that. Well, exactly. And again, you know, we're talking about parallel operations in a three-dimensional fire. And, and, it, and it, that's basically it, right? We're taking the first two company or companies, and then we're taking our second arriving or a third or fourth or additional companies and those assignments. And, and everybody, this goes back to, you said it, everybody should, you should know what the hell you're supposed to do, right? I mean, we've said this before. If you have to stand out there and have to give order after order after order after order after order as the incident commander, um, you know, unless the, uh, again, unless it's a mayday going on, if if it's if you're if you're, I mean, where's your training? Where's your where's your SLGs? Where's your, you know, you know what I'm saying? You've seen that before. Where there's some guys and gals out there that you can't make a move without them having to give you an order or say something to radio. Instead of like I, I used to watch you stand across the street and watch your companies go to work or. Uh, Mitachi Jerry Wells in Louisville came up to me in my office once, John, and had a good secular apartment building fire. And he goes, I think I've arrived. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, I got there. This was the extent of my orders. My, the extent of my orders were, he goes, I, I grabbed my, my, my mic and I went, but, but, uh, uh, oh, it was, he goes, it was all done. He goes, I was going to say this. Well, they got that going. I was going to say this and they got, and I, I, I'm kind of going, well, isn't that where you want your guys? You want your people. Now, now now, in defense of some of the guys that do a lot of order throwing, um, that's because they're in Louisville and you got good staffing. That's because I work in the Bronx and I got good staffing. You go to some small department, career volunteer or otherwise, where they're rolling up with two or three rigs, with maybe two people on each rig or three people on this one and two people on that one. Now, suddenly, we don't have enough people to, to automatically know what they're going to do with that fire. You may have to grab the first engine and say, I need to line at the front door right now. And, and when the second engine gets there, 
they don't know what they're doing because there's, there's, there's not enough people for them to already have a predetermined assignment. So they roll it up thinking, let's see the chief. Chief, what do you need? You need a second line to back them up or you want us to jump on the first line with them? Now, you know what? They got a brand new, jump on the line with them. I need, I need both of you on that first line. Then when the third engine gets there, you know, he may actually have to hand out an assignment to each company because they're, pu they're, they're pulling up with low numbers, with, with, with right. Yeah, you know? again, and I agree with you completely. What I was kind of getting at too, and I, and I understand what you're saying, was, you know, obviously there's orders that have to be given. Listen, any good incident commander, any good BC or shift chief or whatever, or shift commander, you know, there's assignments and orders. Um, I'm, I'm kind of going with that, you know, first do, second do, and all that stuff. But, but at the same time, not overwhelming your people, you know, that already know pretty much what they're supposed to do. But you're right. There are some places where staffing levels, um, response capabilities are, are incapable, you know, being able, you know, delays, uh, whether it's, whether it's, uh, you know, due to trains or just due to the fact that their, their, their stations, their firehouses are, are spread, you know, apart or they're, they're busy and they're waiting for their second due company from another area that, what, what do we, what do we call that? Call it an, like a football, call it an audible, right? right? You know, this is great. And that's what we call them SOGs because they're guidelines, but guess what? It's not going to work at this fire. We have to change gears and say something else. You know what I'm saying? Yep. It's so much like a football game. It's, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of sports you can, you know, and we already know it's a team sport, fight and fire, but it is so much like a football game because we got a lineup and we got a, a bunch of plays that are already established that we practice and we know what to do. And when you make this call, these guys run that way and that guy runs that way. And gosh, it's just like football. And uh, in some places, some some of us that are, that are fortunate enough, you know, have, have the staffing that football has too. Be, imagine running a football team with three or four guys on the field, you know? Um, remember we used to do this kids remember it was like all right john uh you go long and tommy you try to keep them away from me <laughs> yep you run you go to make a left at the volvo what's the volvo but so all right so we're talking with with you know like we said we're talking parallel operations and a three-dimensional fire we're talking about the first two engine company getting there maybe a couple of companies later so we're talking about the initial attack ventilation and maybe initiate the primary search and then we get that we're our second arriving the third arriving the fourth arriving wave i'll say wave of companies not just units you know and, and I, i'm not going to say call them support but yeah you know that's that second line that secondary search maybe vent in a different location maybe you know popping more doors or cutting some burglar bars off or whatever securing a second water source all that right so you get the first two first arriving companies their assignment then you've got that secondary wave you know of attack units if you will you know what i'm saying <laughs> and then like you said, you've got your incident commander. That's where the command and control comes in. You talk about what Jay's looking for. Let, let me hear from Chief John Salka. You pull up, you're in the Bronx, and uh, you pull up at one of your fires. Um, maybe you're covering for the next two battalion. Let's throw it that way. We're covering, you're, you're in a little bit late. You know, you're getting in, and you know there's maybe two engines of truck already there. You know what I'm saying? What, what, are you, what are you expecting when you talk about the parallel operations, kind of a little bit what Jay said, but what do you expect that when you arrive? And again, keep in mind, the example I gave you was, you know, you're not, you're not in the 18th, maybe down the street from 88, you're covered for the next battalion. You're, you know, he's, you know, yeah, you're covering their fire because they're at another job. What are you looking for in the way of parallel operations and command and control as that first arrived battalion chief, when you got companies already working on a scene? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I never really liked, responding from, the, from from another battalion. And once in a while, that had to happen. You know, once in a while, the 2 would be out on a run, and they would send the 1-8 as the first due chief, and I'd be going to another battalion. I'd be leaving my battalion, going to the adjoining battalion, because that chief was out on a run, and I'm simply coming from a, from a longer distance. Other times, I'd be at a division conference, maybe somewhere, or at a drill site, and I'd have to travel to the far end of my district. So let me let me say this first. I, I, I loved it, and I hated it. I I never really want to get there first. I never really want to get there too early. And, and, and my battalion wasn't gigantic geographically. And occasionally I'd be out or I'd, go, I'd be on the way back from somewhere and a run would come in and I'd realize, damn, we're only three blocks away. I'm telling you right now, I've told my, my aides, the guys driving a fire car, I've told them a couple of times, hey, Jack, slow down, slow down. Let's look for 88. They should be coming down a block any minute. I've sat at the intersection. And waited for 88 and 38 to combine. They were three blocks, three blocks down the road. I'm looking at them coming. I sit there and wait for them to come down. We don't need a battalion chief's car in front of a burning building. It doesn't do anything for the building. Okay. 
I don't need to get there ahead of them. I prefer them get there ahead of me. Now, coming from another battalion is the opposite end of that, not, not meaning I would do anything different, but what's great about the FDNY is the first two engines, second two engines, first two trucks, second two trucks, they all have tactical assignments. They all know where they're going. Even if I got there first and was waiting for them, I would say nothing. They know right where they're going. There's, there's a pretty, pretty strong SOP there, right? <clears throat> so if I'm getting somewhere late, or a little bit later than I normally did, or not right on the tail of the first alarm units, they're probably going right where they should be anyway. Now we all know, we all know you can put a fire out without a battalion chief. We already know that because it's been done, right? <laughs> yeah. But what the battalion chief is there for sometimes is is to handle to handle the roadblock, to handle the unexpected event that happens, and suddenly <clears throat> everybody's where they need to be and doing what they need to do, and suddenly you suddenly you can step up and say, hold on a second now. Engine two, back your line out. Engine three, stretch your line over here. You know, rescue, rescue, get in there on the first floor and handle that situation. So different things happen. And I never like getting there really too early. I like following up and letting everybody get sort of in position first. Well, and that, and that, and that you know, that makes sense too. Um, I, and I want to go back to, I, I made a little note of something you said about, you know, we don't need a battalion chief's car in front of the fire building. Yet, how many times you see this, whether we witness it, ourselves or on a video, you know, where they end up, they, look, we, we get all over the cops. I love, you know, we're very, both of us are very partial law enforcement, but we get all over them for blocking hydrants or, or parking where they shouldn't and so on and so forth. Yet sometimes, you know, with all our chiefs, you know, all the chiefs that show up in their many vehicles and fire SUVs, they end up blocking. And I, look, you know, even my Crown Vic, I could find curbs, I could find grass, I could find, you know, the worst thing you do is, is be the, the guy who's running the show and plug up the scene with your car, park it in the wrong spot or screw up somebody's positioning. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like a pretty simple thing, John, but I think it's pretty, pretty important and pretty key. It's another one of those, you know, the many connections, the many links in the chain of a successful incident command chain, if you will, run an incident is that we talk about apparatus and positioning and other thing. We talk about the engine and truck companies and so forth, but, we didn't really talk about the incident commander's positioning. It, it, look, there are some people that have to work it from the cars. They are mandated where they have to either be inside or at the back of the command unit. Even more so important for you to be at a spot where you can see what's going on or, you know, you not be guessing at, at, at what you're hearing, but at the same time, not park it in a spot or position yourself that you're going to plug up something for the truck or the engine, right? Right. Right. I used to, I used to ask my aides all the time, we'd be, we'd be turning, turning into a street or driving down a block and he'd be like, chief, chief, where do you want me to go? I said, we get any water? He said, no. I said, we get any ladders? He said, no. I said, well, park this thing out of the damn way. There's people coming behind us. that got all that stuff. They're going to need it here. Okay. So again, like you said, if you're, if you're, and you know how I feel about running the fire from inside a vehicle. Just don't do. <laughs> no, no, please. You're tell, unfortunate please, enough that you have to do please that. Please tell me. Please. <laughs> Please you got to pick the right driveway or the right front lawn to park on so you can see the building from your car. You, I still don't want you to get in the way of the engine or the truck. There's still the people that are, that are coming in to stretch hose and pull ladders and, and everything else, you know? Well, and I used to say to my guys, SUV or Crown Vic, if I popped, if I jumped a curb and pulled up out of the way, I'm not really worried about the front lawn right now. You, you, they're going to have a lot more damage to worry about when it comes to, look, I'm not doing donuts in their lawn, but I'm trying to get out of the way. Um, you, know, to, you know, so, so I, I I could be up where I need to be or whatever. You and I are both big fans of running the fires from, you know, out in front. But for those that, you know, there's some very successful departments that run them from inside, but you can't be down the block where you can't see nothing. I guess you can if you have good bosses in front, but this whole thing of parking at the end of the street, and I won't go too much on this one and trying to run everything from there. I've got, John, I have audio tapes of an incident commander asking one of his ambulance crews, what color is the smoke coming out of the house or out of the, out of the roof, he said. And listen, I'm like, listen, uh, you've heard really? me say this. If you're parking so far away from that building that you can't see the building, why did you go on the run? Why don't you just do it from the firehouse? The radio will work from your office, won't it? Why don't you just run the fire from your desk in the office? If, you're not, if you can't see the building from where you park your car, what's the point of being there? Exactly. And, and so we're talking this, and I agree, you know, you and I are both on this, we've always been on the same page there, but we're talking, as we're talking about this three dimensional fire, the, the parallel operations, right? First two company or companies, second arriving, a second wave of the second wave of the attack. And then that I see 
you know, kind of grabbing everything and, and put it, you know, smush it all together with command and control. And I'll, I'll ask you, you kind of hinted towards it before. You know me, I've always been a big what if person. One of my favorite phrases I've used for the longest time, John, is think big. I mentioned this a couple of times with us before. When I was a young firefighter, you know, I used to, I'd leave the firehouse to say, see you, we, or we'd leave training. I'd say, John, see you in sector three later. Remember when sector three was the right thing to call the back of the building? You know, because the best place to be at a fire was the back of the building because there, there was usually not a chief back there. We, we could get away from the chiefs. Then when, when, as a BC, you know, we'd leave and the guy say, hey, see you at the big one, chief. I go, you know, think two and a half. And then as a chief, you know, a, a, a chief of department, guys would say, hey, see you at the big one tonight, chief. And I would say, think big. Think big, think big, think big. You, you can't go wrong by thinking big. Getting the help coming early because you could always do what with it, John? Right. You always send them back. Oh, God. I mean, and, and, and should there be any shame and embarrassment of, you know, and I've seen guys, they almost, you can see it, John. They're like, all right, engine five, come on. I need you to go pull like five feet of ceiling. All right, go to rehab. All right, engine, uh, Drew, you come over here and help. It's like they think they have to use everybody to justify the fact that they maybe bumped at another alarm. Where I never had, John, I never had a problem going up, put my arm around the can and say, hey, thanks, man. Uh, the guy's got it. I, I, you know, I wasn't really sure we pulled up, but man, they, they did a great job. Just hanging with me for another five, 10 minutes. If I'm going to cut you loose next, is there any shame with sending people home? I've always said, and even in, and you know, when we teach our classes, when we teach the, uh, the fire scenario element of our, of our programs, I, we always say who, who called for more help at this fire? You know, we got a picture or a video going up there. And some people say, ah, we're handling, we got three engines, two trucks. We got about 12 guys. We can handle that with 12 guys. And then I told them the story about the FDMY. I said, the FDMY sends two engines and two trucks in the chief, maybe even three engines and two trucks if they're all available. And when the first engine gets there, if he sees even just a little bit of smoke coming out of a window, he gives it 1075. The dispatcher sends a fourth engine, a third truck, a squad, a rescue, another battalion chief, and a deputy. Even though there's no way in God's green earth that we're going to need all those companies, but the fact that he calls for more help when he sees that he has something, and I've always told him that, you can never be wrong for calling for more help. No, the farther they have to come, the even earlier you should be calling. Oh, yeah. You know? But but I, I want to make another point before before we finish this up, because there's one important thing that you got to remember about these parallel operations, these these operations where maybe the, 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 the senior incident commander there is maybe starting to set stuff up in case what's going on is not going to work. The one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to steal any resources from the chief that's still initiating the first – strategy you know if they get a line going down a basement if they get a line going up to the second floor trying to push in on a, on a good fire a good body of fire you don't want to take the third engine away and, and tell him stretch a line around to the side for that towel ladder in case we need it because now the third engine is isn't available to help the initial strategy which is still underway and you're almost dooming it by doing that so you don't want to if, you, if you're going to do that you might have to transfer an additional arm or a special call some additional units and start using them to set up whatever you want to set up as that parallel operation but you don't want to steal any resources from the initial, the initial chief who's who's implemented the first strategy, because then, then it may in fact fail because of that, you know, rather than because it wasn't a good idea. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I thought this was a great topic. Parallel operations, so so. great article. Um, you know, the whole three-dimensional fire, like we said, the first two first arriving units, that second wave coming in behind, then the IC pulling everything together, the whole command and control thing, and talking about the what ifs and, and think big. I was always accused of being a what if or I remember a couple of dispatches of Lewis will go, was that our last key second alarm? I'm like, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. And, 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 you know, even more so, I'm glad, I'm glad we didn't have to use everybody. I'm glad the guys only had to wear one bottle in their back for right now until they get their next fire. And you know what? If I had a mayday, guess what? I would have had enough people to, to really give it a good go if I had a firefighter get jammed up or a crew. I don't want to ever get caught short. So there you go. I think thinking big's a good thing, right? I mean, and, and all that. So, yep. well, a great topic, buddy. Hey, give me your email again for our listeners. My email is chiefjohnsalka at gmail.com. And I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. We appreciate you join us for another uh, episode of Old School. And thank you for some of your, your thoughts and some of your ideas. And uh, thank you a lot for some of the great compliments. Uh, that, that, that you've been passing along. Uh, again, it's just John and I having fun, man. It's just us, you know, we, we don't get like some, we don't get paid to do this. This is just us having fun, uh, talking shop, man, talking shop. And, uh, uh, 
hell, I, I, John, I learn something every time I'm around you. So I appreciate that. So I'm, I'm getting educated with it. <laughs> but, uh, but that being said, uh, uh, you know, hit us again. If you, however you're listening to this, uh, make sure your friends know about iTunes and subscribe so you get notified right away. Um, or if they don't have it, tell them to go over to my YouTube channel, Chief Lassie, because John and I post them at both places. And, uh, hey, one last thing, look for our books, uh, Five Alarm Leadership, and I know Pride and Ownership's on Kindle. Uh, very, very soon, they're, they're going to be on, on uh, 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 iTunes, our audio books, on iTunes and Audible. And uh, give us a shout if you need anything. With that, we always ask you to please, please keep the men and women our armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. Um, remember this, and we say it all the time, never forgetting means never forgetting. Thank you. God bless you. And we'll, we'll talk to you next time.